who would win in a fight, an osprey or a pelican? We're gonna talk about that coming up right after this. So who would win in a fight? An osprey or a pelican? Or how about a wood stork or a great blue heron? We're gonna have a really fun competition today. But before I get into that, I just wanna mention something really important. It's an online event that happened this week and it's really the beginning of a movement. It's called Black Birders Week. It's basically a bunch of people who got together on Instagram. You know, they had live sessions and they uh, posted photos. And it's all the beginning of a movement to promote more inclusion of African American people in the birding and nature community and also just diversity in general. And it's just really important that we get more diversity into the birding and nature community. And my experience from what I've seen in the birding community specifically is most birders are older white people who tend to have more money. That's a big generalization, but that tends to be true. And I just wanted to give my support and give a shout out because it's something that I just think is awesome. Sports right now all across the world have been canceled during the pandemic. I know that the Summer Olympics that were supposed to take place this summer are canceled. So I'm gonna do something today that might seem pretty goofy, but maybe it'll be fun. We'll see how it goes. It's called the Bird Olympics. So first one I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna walk around this park and see as many birds I can see and get as much video footage as I can. And then I'm gonna select five species and have them compete against each other in a little Olympics. All right, man, so I'm just doing some solid big water birding here. First, look at all of these wood storks, wow. Just look at all these guys right on top of this roof. Wood storks are super cool. a snowy egret, I see a great egret, I see white ibis, I see royal terns. So how exactly is it going to work? Well, I'm gonna have my five species. I'm just the judge. Uh, most of this is just me kind of, you know, using my own opinion. This is gonna be really subjective. There's gonna be different categories of things about the birds. And I'm just gonna assign the birds different points based on how well they do in each category. So in each category, a bird can get anywhere from one to five points. The first category is really simple. It's just visual aesthetics. So just how beautiful do I think the bird is? You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I know that I might raise a lot of controversy in this video. And by the way, in every single category, I would love to see your thoughts on how you agree or disagree with me in the comments, comment below. All right, the second category is how beautiful do you think are the sounds that the bird makes? The next category is how rare is that bird? And this is actually the one number that is not subjective. I'm actually taking this number straight from a rating that the American Birding Association publishes every year. So it's next category is kind of a weird category to rank, but it's how would I rate its conservation story? So if it's a bird that has always been super common that no one's ever really worried about, then I'll rank it a number one. If it's a bird that currently is in real trouble in terms of conservation, if it's really endangered, then I'll rank it a five. If it's a bird that has had trouble in the past but's recovered a lot, then I'll put it in the middle. So their next category is the reproductive cycle. So if there's anything that's interesting about their mating, whether it's mating rituals and how they attract mates or how they nest you know I'll just rate it from one to five on how entertained I am by it the next category is feeding is there anything interesting about what they eat or how they catch their food by the way as you guys can see I'm just kind of winging it get it and then the last category is migration. So pretty much if a bird migrates really far, it'll get a high rating. If it doesn't migrate at all, it'll get a low rating. There are some species that are actually considered partially migratory, which means that some migrate and some don't depending on the population. And then the next category is probably 
the most interesting and the most fun and maybe the most disturbing. <laughs> but basically, if you theoretically put one bird of each of the five species into a ring and had them all fight each other, not necessarily to the death because I don't wanna be like really dark and just weird here, but you know, if they fought each other until they chickened out, get it, chickened out, all right, that joke wasn't as good, but who would win? And I would rank them from one to five, just based on my opinion, based on like all of their physical attributes. You know, by the way, I'm not promoting any animal violence in this video. I'm totally against animal violence. It's just all theoretical. And then actually one additional thing is I'm gonna provide bonus points. So if there's just extra things that I think are really cool that don't really fit into any category, then I'll just assign bonus points. So it is about to pour rain here and I'm also getting eaten up by flies. I'm actually gonna go home and finish this. <laughs> I am home and it is raining pretty hard outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and just film the rest of this video inside. All right guys, let's get into it. Let's start breaking everything down in our bird Olympics. Now our first bird here is the osprey. Here in Florida, ospreys seem like they're pretty much everywhere. They are these beautiful hawks. You can identify them by their brown back and their white undersides, and they kind of have these S-shaped wings. They have a pretty wide range. They live all across North America. And to start out with our first category on visual beauty, on a ranking from one to five, I think they're beautiful, but to be honest, there's just nothing really special that jumps out at me about them compared to other hawks. Um, so I'll go with a three out of five. For their auditory beauty, I'll play their call right now. <laughs> Meh, that's okay, so I'll give that a three. The rarity factor taken straight from the American Bird Association is a ranking of one because although they're hard to find in some places in North America, um, in some places they're just super common like in Florida. They actually haven't always been really common. In a lot of places they're still of really big conservation concern. From the year 1966 to 2015, their populations actually grew by 2.5% each year, but this is a species that actually was a victim of uh, DDT, the chemical DDT, as maybe you've heard of before. It was a pesticide the agricultural industry used for a long time in the United States. And basically what happened was DDT infiltrated into the aquatic ecosystem and then made its way up the food chain um, up to the fish that osprey eat. And the problem with DDT was it actually caused the thinning of the eggshells of not only ospreys, but many other species of water birds. When birds would sit on their eggs to incubate them, the eggshells would be too thin and they would actually crush their eggshells and kill their babies. So it really affected the reproductive cycle. In 1972, in the United States, they banned DDT. And this had a huge effect on not only ospreys, but um, actually other species of birds that are also in this bird Olympics as well. So I think that's a pretty cool conservation story. However, because ospreys really are not that big of a conservation concern in the United States today, I'll give them a three out of five. So for feeding, I actually gave ospreys a ranking of four out of five because ospreys are really the only hawk that feed almost exclusively on fish. Over 99% of their diet is fish. And it's really cool when you watch them uh, catch their prey, what they do is they kind of soar they'll pause and they'll sort of hover for a moment and then they'll dive down to the water and catch a fish. For their reproductive cycle, I gave them a two out of five just because there's nothing really that spectacular. The nests that they make are really visible. They make these big nests made of sticks. Nests are usually built on snags, treetops, cliffs. And in Florida, ospreys take advantage of building their nests a lot on these human built platforms that they have like pretty much everywhere. Now some people might debate this rating for an osprey in this category because sometimes during the mating season, male ospreys will do a pretty cool thing. They call it a fish flight where uh, male ospreys will carry a piece of debris or a fish or something and they'll sort of fly around in circles kind of putting on some type of display um, before returning to the nest. And then for migration, I actually gave ospreys a four out of five because Ospreys are partially migratory. The ospreys that we have here in Florida, they're here year round, but ospreys that you find up in the northern part of the continent in North America, uh, they do migrate. And a lot of ospreys migrate really far distances. In fact, an osprey can actually log more than 160,000 miles 
uh, of migration during its entire lifetime. My first bonus point for the Osprey is that Ospreys generally have about a 25% success rate when they dive to catch a fish. Generally, that's greater than I thought, so I'll give that a bonus point. And then Ospreys also have specially adapted feet to catch their fish. They actually have a reversible toe that actually allows them to grab a fish with two toes in front and one toe in back. I think that that's pretty cool. All right, man, let's keep on breaking this down like Boomer on prime time. Next bird is the white ibis. White ibises are these beautiful wetland birds. They have these long curvy beaks. The white ibis you can find in southeastern North America all throughout Central America, and the adults are this bright white with uh, this brilliant bright pink face and bill. And often you will see immature white ibises, which actually aren't all white. They have blotches of brown on them as well as you can see here. And this is a water bird. You can find them in freshwater marshes, saltwater marshes. You can even find them on the beach. Visual beauty, I give them a three out of five. They are super beautiful, but the problem is there's a lot of other birds that look kind of like them. For how beautiful I think the sounds white ibis make, I'll play their call right here. <laughs> I give them a two. For their conservation concern, I gave them a rating of two. Uh, their population numbers have increased steadily since the 1960s. With feeding, I gave them a three. They feed primarily on uh, aquatic invertebrates. I just think it's pretty cool that they've evolved such a long curve shaped bill to help them prod into the sediment of whatever wetland they're on. You know, birds have all different shapes of bills and beaks and stuff. and. A lot of times uh, you can predict what kind of food a bird eats based on just the shape of its bill. For breeding, I gave them a three. So they nest in colonies and trees and before they build their nest, the males actually put on a display for the females where the males will fly around in these circles and then they'll approach the females and grab the females by the head and shake the female around um, kind of violently. Sometimes apparently the female heads will bleed um, I just thought that was interesting. I mean, it sounds brutal and it sounds immoral, but I just thought it was really interesting. Okay, now on to the bonus points. One bonus point is awarded to white ibis because males are actually really aggressive and protective of their females. White ibis will actually form seemingly monogamous pairs, although I guess a male can mate with multiple females in a season. And then I just want to award another bonus point because baby white ibis are actually born with straight bills and they don't begin to grow a curved bill until after they're like two weeks old, which I just think that's kind of interesting. That deserves a bonus point as well. Now onto our next bird in the Bird Olympics, the brown pelican. Brown pelicans live on much of the saltwater coast across North America down through much of South America. They're these big, huge, sort of clumsy birds with these gigantic bills and they're just one species of pelican that we have in North America. The other one is the white pelican. But you can differentiate brown pelicans from white pelicans because of their brown color and I just don't think they're particularly beautiful birds. Um, so I gave them a three. I don't think they're super ugly but I don't think they're super beautiful either. For how beautiful the sounds that brown pelicans make, I'll play it for you right here. <laughs> to be honest, I don't think they really sound like anything that cool, so I'll give them a one. According to the ABA list, they have a rarity factor of one. And brown pelicans as well are partially migratory, so some of them will migrate decent distances but I'll give them a three just because they do migrate somewhat. So brown pelicans are another bird that actually were impacted by DDT and other pesticides. They actually used to be endangered, but again, because of the ban of DDT and other conservation efforts, their numbers have rebounded dramatically and now they have very stable populations. They're pretty common. So I'm giving them a three on their conservation rating. For eating, I will give them a four. As you might expect, brown pelicans feed primarily on fish and what they do is they fly high and then they dive down and hit the water. And what happens is uh, their bottom throat pouch actually expands and takes in all this water with fish in it. And it can actually expand to a volume of two and a half gallons. The reproductive cycle, I gave them a rating of two. I just don't think there's really anything that interesting about their mating system. Pelicans will nest in these pretty big colonies on islands 
that are free from predators. That's pretty typical of seabirds. Uh, they're monogamous, at least throughout the breeding season. And I guess kind of the coolest thing that I've read about their whole reproductive cycle is that they will regurgitate their food when they feed their young. But that's actually really typical of a lot of species of birds. For migration, I gave them a rating of three because again, this is a partially migratory species. Brown pelicans get one bonus point because the oldest brown pelican ever known to survive was actually 43 years old. And then here's another thing that I thought was pretty interesting is when pelicans dive down to catch their food, they actually kind of tuck their head to the side to help cushion their neck and their esophagus. And apparently that helps protect their neck because when they dive, they're actually going pretty fast. Now our next bird in the bird Olympics, the great blue heron. You've probably seen great blue herons before, very common throughout much of North America. They're a big water bird with these skinny legs and a long bill. And you can find them in saltwater wetlands, freshwater wetlands. You can even find them on the beach. In my opinion, these are the most beautiful birds in the Bird Olympics. I give them a four for their visual beauty. I will play their sound right here. Again, I don't think that was that cool of a sound, so they get a two out of five. The rarity factor taken from the ABA list is one. Now these guys are another partially migratory species and I gave them a three out of five. For their conservation story, I gave them a three out of five. They were also affected by pesticides and DDT, but since the 1960s, their numbers have actually increased. And for their feeding, I give them a two just because, I don't know, there's not really anything that's too special about the way they eat. They have a really generalist diet. They eat anything from fish, um, invertebrates, small mammals, uh, small reptiles. Oftentimes they will actually impale their prey with their bill, which I guess is kind of cool. For the reproductive system, I gave them a three out of five. These guys are monogamous throughout the breeding season, but I guess they choose new mates each year. Often nest in colonies, either on the trees or on the ground. I've actually seen this done before at heron colonies. What they'll do is a uh, pair bonding display where they, it's like a ritualized greeting type of thing where they'll actually erect uh, the big feathers on top of their heads. They'll clapper their bill tips, which means like they'll basically touch their bill tips together. It's kind of cool. So they get one bonus point because although they're pretty big birds, like they can be over four feet tall, uh, they only weigh on average about five to six pounds. And that's because they have these really hollow bones. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And another thing that I thought was interesting that deserves a bonus point is in many parts of the country, great blue heron populations have actually uh, recovered due to beaver populations because beavers are pretty much ecosystem engineers and help the recovery of wetlands. So I thought that was pretty cool as well. And last but not least is, in my opinion, kind of an ugly bird, but my favorite bird personally. I don't know if it's gonna win, but this is my favorite bird of this whole bird Olympics. And this is the wood stork. And I think the reason why the wood stork is my favorite bird of this bird Olympics is because they have the smallest range out of all the other birds in this bird Olympics. They also live throughout Mexico and in parts of the Caribbean, but in North America, their range is really limited. In the United States, you can find them in Florida and they do migrate to some other parts of the Southeast, but they are much less widely distributed than like the white ibis, for example. I think these guys are kind of ugly just cause they're just kind of these bald, nasty birds. No offense to myself. <laughs> they get a two out of five. I will play their sound right here. Meh, I'll say that's another two out of five. Notice how there were no songbirds in this whole bird Olympics. Most of these birds were just big water birds um, that really overall just did not make that cool of sounds. So sorry, that was not an entertaining part of this video. The rarity factor taken straight from the ABA is a one. For migration, they are technically partially migratory. They do do a little bit of migration across the Southeast, but really not that much. So I gave them a two on that. Now for their conservation rating, I actually gave them a four because apparently their overall population in the world, it's over 450,000 birds. It's pretty stable. 
In the United States, they're actually listed as federally threatened, and I think that has to do at least in part because their range is so limited in the United States. For feeding, I gave wood storks a two. So wood storks live around wetlands and they'll feed in wetlands. What they do is it's pretty similar to a white ibis. They'll just wade through the water and then they'll dip their head down and they'll feel around with their bill for any prey, which is usually uh, crustaceans, other types of aquatic invertebrates. But because white ibis have even more of a specialized bill for this feeding style, I just kind of think the wood stork should be ranked a little bit lower. And again, just like ibises, just like herons, they'll make their nests in trees and colonies. They will be a monogamous pair for the season. And so because the mating system and the nesting really relatively isn't that much different between wood storks and ibises and great bull herons, I just decided to give wood storks a three in this category as well. But wood storks actually get one bonus point for regurgitating water on their young to cool their young down. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then they just get another random bonus point because storks have just such a big influence on historical myths and everything. Like so many people when they're a kid they hear the myth about you know, stork babies. So now we have the most exciting part of the video that you guys have all been waiting for. But here's the part where I analyze what would happen if you put all five of these birds into an enclosed area and watched them fight. Let's just try to answer the simple question. Who would win in a fight ranked from one to five? Okay, so I'm gonna start from the bottom. I think number five would be a white ibis. All five of these birds are relatively big birds. In fact, none of these birds even really weigh hardly anything compared to a human. Now the reason why the white ibis would come in last place is because even though it's not that small of a bird, all of these birds that I analyzed in this video are relatively big birds. Even though they don't really weigh that much compared to a human, the thing is a white ibis just doesn't have that much power. And I think that you know, if a white ibis gave a human a nip in the hand, he could probably do some damage but that bill, I just don't think has any edges that are quite as sharp as some of the talons and some of the other bills that some of the other birds in our bird Olympics have. So between lacking any really sharp weapons on its body and also lacking size and power, I think the white ibis would come in last. I put wood stork as number four because they're just kind of like a white ibis, but they're bigger and more powerful. You know, they don't have the sharp talons of an osprey. Their bill is not as sharp as a great blue herons. Um, and they're just not as powerful as a pelican. And now we're getting to the top three where I think there's gonna be a lot of debate over these, but I put the great blue heron as number three. And I do think that a great blue heron could use that sharp point of bill to impale some of the other birds. Like I mentioned earlier in this video, even though it's a pretty big bird, it's pretty tall, it's also pretty light. And I just don't really think it really has that much power. It weighs significantly less than a pelican. And I also think a great blue heron would lose to an osprey because ospreys are not that agile for a raptor, but they're definitely way more agile and can gain way more speed than a great blue heron. And ospreys have those really sharp talons that I think are nothing to mess with. This choice might be even more controversial, but I put the osprey as number two and then the brown pelican as number one. They just can generate so much power. They are the biggest birds out of all these five birds when they fly they go up in the air they can dive bomb i just really envision pelicans just being too much too much power for an osprey the talons of an osprey are nothing to mess with and i think this would be pretty close but i just think that a brown pelican is just way too big and i think what they could also do is they could use that huge pouch underneath their lower jaw and actually just pretty much swallow the head of another bird and just suffocate that bird. And now it is time for the ultimate tally to see who wins. Some of you, uh, this video is just too darn goofy. Uh, so let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Let me know if you want any more bird Olympics or not. Thank you guys very much. Have fun birding.